What exactly is collaboration? On the surface, the term is one that we think we understand instinctively. But in this short lecture, Urs Hirschberg, who is professor for the representation of architecture and new media and head of the Institute of Architecture and Media, IAM, at TU Graz, and of course a contributing editor to the Atlas of Digital Architecture, delves into the different types and modes of collaboration and what they mean to us specifically as architects. And if you would like to hear more about his pioneering work on collaborative team projects both at ETH Zurich and at Harvard, there is also a supplementary talk available about them here in this unit. Why is there a chapter on collaboration in our atlas? Why is collaboration important for architecture? Well, the answer is quite obvious because you can't create architecture on your own. To create anything but the simplest little hut, you need more than one person to build it. And for a building of any complexity, this isn't only true of the building process, but also of the design process. It takes a team. People with different skills and different areas of expertise working together, collaborating. Collaboration is at the heart of the discipline of architecture. And equally obvious, digital media have changed how people collaborate profoundly. The digital age has been called an age of sharing and indeed today we share data in ways unimaginable even 20 years ago. In our professional as well as in our private lives. Pictures, music, movies, documents, forms, programs, contracts, you name it. We can exchange it online, buy it, sell it. More and more business is done online. And of course, this also has a deep impact on how we work together. So collaboration is an important topic for architecture and it's an important topic for the digital world. And combined, it's a vast topic. There are many new digital ways we can use to collaborate. And there's a lot of software that enables these new types of collaboration. By the way, most CAD and BIM programs have long supported various ways of working together by linking or referencing different drawings. This was possible already well before the internet boom. Nowadays, these functions have become even more evolved. There are dedicated servers set up to manage major building information modeling projects. But we're not going to get into that here. If we set out to describe different programs and their workflows and user interfaces, this lecture would get very long and that's not the idea. The point here is I want to give you an overview of the topic and I want to get you interested in learning more about it yourself. So what are the different types and modes of collaboration? Maybe to start with the most basic distinction, we can differentiate between synchronous and asynchronous types of collaboration. For synchronous, that is real-time collaboration, so people working together at the same time, one big change is that it can now happen over large distances and across time zones. We've all experienced this during the pandemic. Working from our home, we could still have meetings, discuss urgent matters, or brainstorm with our colleagues using some video conferencing software. In fact, the Atlas, as well as this MOOC, were collaborative efforts and the people involved in creating it live in different cities or different countries and we mostly met online to discuss our progress. And while we may be a bit tired of all the video conference, we also learned that some types of synchronous collaboration actually work better online with each person in front of their own screen than in front of only one screen with people taking turns in controlling the mouse, etc. So that's synchronous collaboration, and obviously it's important. Asynchronous collaboration is also enhanced. We can share files online and people can work on them whenever they find time to do so, and of course also wherever they are, as long as they have access to the network. And they can then share a new version of the file they worked on with their colleagues again. The distinction between synchronous and asynchronous collaboration actually isn't always very strict. Some software support both types. So without going into further detail, we can say that digital media 
have opened up new ways to collaborate across space and time. Space and time, that's a lot. But these aren't the only things that have changed. An important question in any collaborative effort is, who makes the rules? Who decides what needs to be done, how it should be done, and who should do it? In other words, who's the boss? Or do we even need a boss? If there's one boss that gives orders, that's also referred to as top-down management. Whereas if we trust the people doing the actual work that they know best, then that's referred to as its counterpart, bottom-up. The two terms aren't only used to describe management styles, by the way. We also use them to describe research methods, for example. If you base your research inquiry on a pre-existing theoretical model, which you try to prove, then that's a top-down method. Whereas if you try to empirically gain data from which you subsequently derive your theory, that's a bottom-up approach. In practice, the pure forms of top-down and bottom-up are rare. Usually some pragmatic mixture of top-down and bottom-up methods is required to achieve the best results in management as well as in scientific research. Now, why do I mention these modes? In this question again, the digital has added a new twist, as we will see in a moment when we talk about open source development. The two terms, top-down and bottom-up, are echoed in a paper from 1997, which later became a book titled The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Originally, its author, Eric S. Raymond, presented it in, as a speech at a Linux conference in Germany and he compared two styles of open source development. What he called the cathedral could also be called the top-down method, whereas what Raymond called the bazaar is the bottom-up approach. So the title is actually a bit problematic in how it seems to pit East against West or even Christ the Christian world with their cathedrals against the typically Muslim countries where bazaars are coming. But this really wasn't the point of the paper, which didn't have any such political agenda. It really just tried to find more interesting terms than top-down and bottom-up. And top-down is usually if somebody makes a design and then lets other people work on it, that's the cathedral mode. Whereas if nobody is the boss and everybody just does what they want, what, what you end up is what looks like a bazaar when people just run around each according to their own interests. Now, the surprising thing in the open source context is that open source development, which works according to this bazaar logic, is actually surprisingly powerful. Now, let me get to a definition what open source is. Here's one that is from the Red Hat website. Red Hat is a major Linux distribution and um, Linux famously is an open source project. So what they say on their website is what is open source? It's a term that originally referred to open source software. Open source software is code that is designed to be publicly accessible. Anyone can see, modify and distribute it distribute the code as they see fit. And open source software is developed in a decentralized and collaborative way, relying on peer review and community production. Open source software is often cheaper, more flexible, and has more longevity than its proprietary peers because it is developed by communities rather than a single author or company. And they also point out that open source has become a movement Here's a second definition, one that's from the Wikipedia page, where they also point out that you know, not only is it developed in a collaborative public manner, but it's also a type of collaboration where anyone can participate online. So making the number of possible contributors indefinite. So that, again, is a change when we think about collaboration before digital media, teams of people that would collaborate were defined and could not be, could not grow to any number. Whereas in the online world, in particular in open source development, there is no limit to how many people could collaborate. 
And that is interesting, particularly because it's done in this bizarre mode where it's not clear who is the boss, who makes the rules, and who says what needs to be done. Here, Linus Torvalds, poster child of the, this open source movement, having founded the development of Linux, this uh, uh, open source uh, operating system. He initially did that for himself. He just uh, wanted to have a Unix-like uh, software on his PC, whereas Unix was the leading operating system in the sort of professional world and in academia. The, it wasn't available on PCs. He wanted something like that. He started developing it and it became a smash hit and has completely taken over all the Unixes. So when I say became a smash hit, it still isn't a smash hit on the desktop. So here's the desktop world completely dominated by Windows. There's a big of Mac and a tiny, tiny sliver of Linux. It does look different when you look at tablets and smartphones. Android is actually a Linux derivative and there it's already more powerful and this share of Android is actually growing. And when you look at supercomputers, Linux is completely dominant. There is no other operating system that uh, can hold its water there. And there's a lot of other open source software like Apache, for example, is far beyond the most uh, common web server software. And so um, in, in many ways, this open source model that we think of, oh, of only creating bazaars and, and being chaotic, is the thing that can create cathedrals, so to speak. And again, from Wired in 2003, they predicted that open source would uh, soon be everywhere and that software is just the beginning. Now, open source, as we saw, means the source code is freely available and can be changed by anybody. And amongst the well-known open source project, there's not just Linux and Apache that I mentioned, but there's also MySQL, PHP, OpenOffice, Mozilla, Android, and many more. Now I should add there's FreeCAD, there is uh, Blender, there's GIMP. There's a lot of uh, software for the desktop also being developed in an open source fashion. And not so well known, pretty much all the tools that the internet rides on were open source developments. And uh, Wikipedia, that's one of the examples where uh, it goes beyond software. Is, uh, it's also referred to as an open source project, even though it's not a software project. Here it's about encyclopedic knowledge that is collected and organized in this fashion. And while it initially was derided a bit and people said, oh, if you really want to get solid information, you look, you take the Brockhaus or the Britannica, it has completely taken over from them and it is now the most accurate and most trusted encyclopedia. Again, all done by hobbyists without uh, a boss that does that. There's also this logo here, the Creative Commons logo, that if you go to their website, you see that at this point, it goes in all kinds of areas. It is no longer limited to software. So all of this shows that open source is becoming more and more popular. Here are some uh, famous projects or well-known projects that you can find online. Linux is that penguin. Uh, Wikipedia, obviously, we've mentioned GNU and various others. Even people like Elon Musk are coming around or have come around to the idea of open source in that they no longer, they've started going into this sharing mode, you know, because it makes sense to share software about cars. So what about architecture then? Are there any examples? You know, here we see Gary Cooper in The Fountainhead, the famous film about a genius architect that is misunderstood by his peers. That is still, there is still a, a bit of that, even though we know, we've realized how much uh, we can gain by collaborating with others. There's still a lot of that around in the architectural world. Now, we have to say 
the idea that only individuals can be creative is a bit in, put into question by the fact that some of the most famous uh, architecture offices are actually, you know, offices with not just one but two bosses. And of course, then there is the, the, the truth that, as I pointed out earlier, you know, offices have many more creative people that collaborate in bringing about uh, projects. The open source model still hasn't really made it into the architecture field. There are some examples. The websites that you find about that aren't really wildly successful yet. So there's the Open Building Institute, here's the open source architecture community. Maybe one of the most well-known projects in architecture is the Wikihouse project here. Wikihouse is a an open source project about sharing of data about a simple construction method based on plywood, basically which you then computer mill and have all these joints. And it's uh, this is gaining traction. And as you can see um, here on the website, you find a lot of information about successful uh, wiki houses being built. Another uh, example from the furniture world is there's this uh, project called Open Desk, where furniture designers openly share their designs. And the idea is, when you see, it's about local making. So you share the plans and the manufacturing can actually happen locally. Now, as I said, these projects, they're very interesting, but they're not like, they ha don't have a huge impact yet. But you should all, one could also add that it doesn't, you know, open source isn't everything. Actually, the more important thing is this discovery that you need a community. Food for Rhino is such a successful community. The popular visual scripting language Grasshopper, uh, here you can find plugins for it. And they don't need to be open source necessarily. But what you have here is an active vibrant community of people that discuss these tools and the plugins and uh, you can get help here from people that uh, you know that you can exchange you can also exchange notes whether you can give uh, feedback to the developers and in that spirit uh, in that sense this you know open source is one of the ways this can be done but sharing is really the essence of it and the most important aspect of these various sharing websites isn't that you can get things for free, but it's uh, the community. Because that, with all the many changes that are introduced with the possibilities of the online world to the way we collaborate, the one thing that remains constant about collaboration is it's always about people and it's always about doing things together. So this is the thought I want to Leave you with. Thanks for listening and bye.